Shalom, brothers and sisters. This week's Sunday sermon is going to be a bit shorter. I apologize. I did not have time this week to put together a full-blown service for you. So I'm going to share with you a scripture, a message, and a prayer, and I pray that it's enough. The scripture we share with you is one of my absolute favorites. It's John 3.17, and I know John 3.16 is a really, really popular one, so I'm going to go ahead and read that one too. And then we share with you why I love 3.17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I understand why John 3.16 is so popular. We have a message here that, well, if you're a Trinitarian, God came himself in the guise of a son or sent a portion of himself in, as his son. And as those of us that believe in the idea of a separate father and son, he literally sent someone that he loves so much, his only begotten child, to sacrifice himself for us. That is a beautiful message. And yet, 17 is the one that sticks out to me because it says, not to condemn the world. And I think that's a really important message right now. Because, well, and a number of reasons. And I'm going to go into the personal to the everybody. Personally, I believe, and I've seen, and I know that one of Satan's biggest attacks on us is to tell us we're not good enough. Whatever it is we're doing is so terrible that the atonement isn't powerful enough and it can't save us. But the, Jesus didn't send us here to hand us all over to the devil and send us all to hell. He came here because he's God. And because Jesus is, I am, he is Yavah, he is the creator. He has all the power and authority through the Father. And if he's not powerful enough to keep us out of hell, and the atonement isn't powerful enough to keep us out of hell, then what's the point of any of it, right? So, on a personal level, it's important that we understand that Jesus did not come here to condemn us, but to save us. I've talked to so many people who think that their sins are so terrible that they can't be forgiven. And I'll tell you a personal experience. There was one time I was on my knees. I was crying. I was begging for forgiveness. I was, God, please, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me for, for the wrongs I've done. Please help me be a better person. And the voice of God came to me and said, do you really think this is the worst thing that someone's ever confessed to me? Do you really think this is the worst thing that a human being has done on this planet? And I was instantly reminded of atrocities happening all over the world. And God said, if I can forgive these people, what makes you think I can't forgive you? There's a very famous story of a African warlord who just murdered and just pillaged and did horrible things in his area, in his country there in Africa. But when he found Jesus, became a preacher, he became just as good as he had been evil. I was reminded of that, and I just thought to myself, if God can forgive him, he can forgive anybody. It is a beautiful story, not because of the atrocities, but because our God is so merciful that he will forgive anyone that comes to him. The only exception is those that deny the Holy Ghost, those that know beyond a shadow of a doubt the goodness of God and walk away anyway, because to their very core, they are perdition. It's not that God won't forgive them. It's that the pride and egoism is so great that eternally they will never wish to be forgiven. So, my first message for you is, whatever it is you've done, whatever it is you're doing, 
It's Satan that's condemning you. That's why his name is Satan. In Hebrew, it literally means accuser, adversary. He is telling you you're not good enough. And Jesus is saying you're wrong. You are good enough. I love you and you're mine. And it's important to God and it's important to me that you know that. And it's not just you. And that's the second part of this. It's the whole world. Right now, there are wars, there are rumors of wars, and the reality is that there always are. I don't think that the United States, the country that I live in, has not been at war since the Civil War, fulfilling Joseph Smith's pro prophecy. When World War One, World War Two, all the different skirmishes in between, Vietnam War during the Cold War, the wars over the Middle East lasted over two decades. And yet, God has not come to condemn this world. It reminds me of Abraham talking to God about Sodom and Gomorrah. And God saying, as long as there are this many people in there, I won't destroy it. And if there's less, I'll just remove them. And so he went and got Lot's family out. We can't condemn this world. We can't call it a hell or anything like that. Because God doesn't condemn the world. Therefore, how can we? And that's very important because Matthew 7, 1 through 5 tells us not to judge. And the Joseph Smith translation version says, unless it's a righteous judgment. And the only way we can righteously judge is to judge ourselves. And I just said, God didn't come here to condemn us, and so therefore we can't condemn ourselves either. We need to see the beauty in this world. If we're going to shine the light of Christ from us, we can't keep looking at the negative. There's a lot of bad stuff going on right now. Rights are being taken away. And religious dominion is being forced on people. The religion of men are trying to force people to join their churches, or if not, then they're going to force them to listen to their opinions, whether you want to listen to it or not. Do we condemn these people? These people who say, I don't want rights. I want to put people in power that will take my rights away and yours too. No. Because if God didn't come here to condemn, we don't either. We have to love them. I've talked before about the reality that our idea of justice is finite. We need to gain an eternal perspective of justice. It's easy to say, oh, these people need to get what they deserve. It's harder to say, these people have done wrong, and I love them. But that's what Jesus told us to do at the very end of chapter 5 of Matthew. Love your enemies. I don't like to think of myself as having enemies, but I know that other people see me as their enemy. I don't have enemies. I have people that aren't my friends yet. I have people that I love that don't love me yet. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to state my opinion on what I think is right and what I think is wrong. But what it does mean is that when someone tells me that I'm wrong, I'm going to love them. I'm going to accept them. I'm going to welcome them. Because if we don't, are we better than God? If God didn't come here to condemn us, are we gods ourselves that are so powerful that we can condemn? That's Satan's role. He's the accuser. We must take the role of Christ as Christians upon ourselves. 
And that's why the cross of Jesus is so heavy and so hard to bear. Because our finite minds, we want justice. We want it now. But justice was already served 2,000 years ago. When Jesus was hung upon the cross. When Jesus sweat as if it were blood in Gethsemane. When Jesus rise, rose from the third day. When Jesus rose on the third day. So that we all may rise. When we decide to condemn other people. then we're taking the role of Satan and not the role of Jesus. Now, again, that doesn't mean that, you know, right now there's a lot of things going on where people are taking people's rights away. The, the government is taking people's rights away. And it's been going on for a long time. I mean, I remember when I first got up in arms about it after 9-11. They came in and took a lot of our constitutional rights away here in the United States for our, our protection, they say. But at the end of the day, what about the Christians living in the Soviet Union during the Cold War? You think our rights got taken away? They were persecuted and shot for believing in God. And yes, it's easy to say, oh, it's always, it can be worse somewhere else. It can be worse somewhere else. But what we need to do is think, how can we make it better and less divisive? Because in my mind, that's the real problem here in the United States and in the world. It's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong. It's a matter of the fact that we've been trained not to talk to each other. We've been trained that our own, we've been trained to think that our own neighbors are our enemies. I have people that write horrible messages to me on Facebook and send me horrible emails to tell me what a sinner I am because I love gay people. Because I love transgender people. Because I use the term LGBTQ. Does God care about that? No, it's just some weird political agenda that people said, oh, we can we can accept these people as long as they don't talk to anybody else and, and don't call them by the terms that we've kind of forced on them. And what do I say to these people? You can see in my Facebook comments, I love you where you are. And I know some people think I'm saying that to mock them, but I'm not. I do love them where they are. Just because you disagree with me doesn't make you my enemy. That's a reality, not a concept. That's a reality that we need to understand today. And it's my prayer that we can begin to heal as a nation and as a world by loving more. And I know that some of you who have been reading my blogs and hearing me talk about this for the past, what, seven years now, maybe you get tired of hearing that. But there really isn't anything new to say. It's the same thing Jesus said. And I'm not better than Jesus, so I'm not going to have some better message than Jesus did and does. Because this isn't my message. I'm just an echo. I'm just telling you what Jesus teaches throughout the scriptures, what he teaches today through the prophets and apostles that are following him and teaching his message, sharing his gospel. The light of Jesus Christ is love. The last thing I want to share with you, and I'm not really sure how to tie this into the overall message. You'll notice today I'm talking to you wearing a t-shirt, and I've received emails of people condemning me because I... When I normally do a sermon or any kind of um, service, worship service, I normally wear the Latter-day Saint or Mormon garments, uh, the robes of the priesthood, and a tallit. 
and people have had some really rude things to say about that. But I felt impressed by the spirit this morning to talk about that. I don't mind the condemnation. I'm not trying to mock anybody, and I understand. You know, you've been raised to believe that those things are special, and you got to keep them hidden. Well, in the fellowship of Christ, we don't believe that. The scriptures very clearly state in the doctrines of the saints that these things were never meant to be hidden. So what is the purpose of them? Why do we wear them? Well, first off, it's optional. Not everybody does. But for me, they are the great equalizer. It's really easy for me to quote the revelation that says, it just says a, a farmer puts on his work clothes to go plow in the field. You put on the clothes of the Lord to go do the Lord's labor, to go, to go work for the Lord in, in his fields. Harvesting souls. But to me, it's the great equalizer. It doesn't matter. I, I know people make fun of the fact that I wear a t-shirt and shorts or jeans under my temple clothes. But that's the whole point. It doesn't matter if you're wearing a suit and tie or if you're wearing a tank top. Once we put on those robes of the priesthood, it's a great equalizer. We're all dressed the same. It's not unity and conformity. It's unity and diversity. They're all, everyone that, that has made their own garments, they're all different. Some people still use the garments sold by the Salt Lake City Church. We don't do this to condemn anyone, but rather to unite us in Christ. Anyone that feels called to the ministry, whether it's a personal ministry in your own home, or a ministry in the fellowship, or a ministry anywhere else, we will ordain you. And you can wear the garments and the robes of the priesthood. Because we're all the same. We don't have a uniform, per se. But we do have sacred clothing that the Lord has introduced to us through Joseph Smith. And through the Holy Spirit, we wear those same robes today in our own ways. And those ways are diverse. But please understand that when we do so, we're not doing it out of condemnation. We're doing it out of love and respect. Because the Lord commanded us to, and like I said in my mind, because he is a great unifier. We can all dress in a way that's comfortably and represent the Lord in the way that we feel fit. And for those that do not wish to wear the robes of the priest to the garments, no one's going to force you to. That's the nice thing about not having a church, but having an ecumenical movement. In the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship, you are the church, not some organization. I'm not your leader. I'm just a facilitator. I'm not trying to gather souls to come and build some great big huge movement. I'm just humbly asking that we love each other and work together. And I think that's important to understand because it goes right back to God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Because if we are truly Christians, then our message cannot be to condemn the world. It cannot be to tell the people, this is what you're doing wrong. We must have the same message that Jesus has. I love you. I don't condemn you. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that you are important to me, that you matter to me. I want you to know that, yes, I have seven children, I am very busy, but I'm always here for you. And if you need me, and you reach out to me, I will make time to talk to you 
and to be there for you. Not just because that's my calling, it's what God told me what to do, but because I love you. And it's important to me personally to know that you know that you're loved. It's my prayer that if you know that I love you, you'll know that God loves you. And if you don't know that I love you, then hopefully you'll still know that God loves you. And it's my prayer that you take that love out into the world. And as you are loved, that you will love one another. That is my message this Sunday. And I leave it with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Elohim Shaddai, we bow our heads at this time in prayer before thee. Again, to thank thee for the many blessings and opportunities you've given us. For your scriptures and your Holy Spirit so that we may understand them. For one another and the Holy Spirit so that we can speak spirit to spirit understanding one another for this technology that we've been blessed with so that wherever we are in the world we can know that we are not alone that we're not isolated that we're not condemned that there are saints fellow saints throughout the world and that there are only a phone call or a video chat or an email away. We pray that we will have the resources that we need to build the temples that you have asked us to build, not temples dedicated to a church but dedicated to you that all may come and worship regardless of denomination that those that do not have the financial ability to have a meeting place to gather in your name may come and have a place to worship We thank you for the financial blessings that we have received for the scripture fund so that we can make scriptures more affordable for those that are seeking to read your word. And we pray that those that have the resources to give and to share will offer these blessings up so that we may reach our goals. And not just for the scriptures fund, but also for the technology fund and other things that we need to help keep your work alive here in the fellowship. We're not gathering to try to start some new organization, but as humble saints, as independent Mormons, throughout the world with our own diverse ideas and theologies. The one thing that unifies us is your son, Jesus Christ. And we know that that's enough. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we know that's enough. And whenever two or more of us gather in your name, that you are there. And we thank thee for this opportunity and this blessing 
to share testimony one with another, to love one another. And for the power of your atonement and the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to see past our differences politically, ideologically, theologically, and see the truth that does bring us together, the truth that does unite us. The love of your Son, Jesus Christ. His teachings, His sacrifice, His atonement for us. We pray to you that our light will shine forth in the darkness and help our fellow beings see what you see in your creation, that it is good. That all we need to destroy the darkness is a little bit of light. smallest flame from a candle can eliminate so much darkness. And it is our prayer that as each one of us lights a flame as one of your candles, that the world will shine bright with your light, the very light of Christ, to heal the creation to bring the love that allowed this world to come into being. To fill it once again. To divide the light from the darkness. And chase that darkness away. So that only your love and your light remain. We know this is possible because through you all things are possible. Again, we thank you for all of your many blessings. We pray that the needs of the many and the few will be met as we help one another and as your miracles come into our lives, healing us in all ways that we need healed. We pray that we will find one another and be a source of light for each other. That just as your will is done in heaven, it will be done here on the earth also. These things we pray in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. So mote it be. Amen. I want to thank all of you for joining me today and taking the time to watch this video. And I would encourage you that if this message resonates with you, to please share it with other people. Share it on social media. Share it through emails. Share its message when you're talking to others wherever you are. And do what you can to let people know that they are loved. So that John 3.17 can not only help heal you, but also help you teach. God bless.